knows what that smile revealed, not looking back beyond decline years from when they met. A long line of hopefuls in the chill, the interview at Faber for that job would take her far and far beyond those years, and all for that one faked broken arm. The plaster cast won him over nonetheless, revealing no lesser truth professed when she became keeper of the flame. Tom's books in the next room consumed by the same embers listened in. A chilly air, a drafty street, it's getting late. A lot of these poems are written for poets, actually, as we go through the, the uh, selection here. Some you may have heard of, some you may not have, but <coughs> they're all go Googleable. <laughs> 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 David Ignatow, 1914-1997. I am as guilty as many. No one speaks of David Ignatow anymore. No one speaks of your lonesome time in the New York boonies, those outer reaches of Jamaica where the Z and J lines go no more. No one speaks of your sparsely furnished rooms, the low-slung Danish sofa where you sit and muse and daydream out the grimed window on rainy days. Even in the warmth of spring, there is no spring. You don't go out much, I would imagine. I imagine much for the both of us. All those darknesses at noon, those woodlands filled with songbirds twittering, even scribblings on the morning times is but a momentary respite. Words we've been blessed with, still blessed, even in our nightly dreams unfinished. Where art thou now, David? Where is the love for my desperation, that I may fight your fears? This is from the, the, the title of the book of uh, new poetry. This is called Whisper Sweet Nothings. I want to squeeze in one more summery dream before it turns to be my guess. One more chance in coup de de Malame style as if he were some long lost couturier in the boonies and not the prank he proved to be. One more chance, one more before I get up to pee, before this number seven pentel runs out of ink. Where will this leave me? Will those darkened woods and winding creeks still be waiting like a charm? Will that make me more lost or will I find my way to some crawling field cleared of night's debris? All those barnyard rusty words I've been avoiding, all those darknesses, Will she, what's her name, be waiting, or will she be the one and only morning fade out with all its ailing unpredictabilities? Her name is slowly fading, fading. No, no! Is that the way the dream's telling me to go? Hug me close, will you? Whisper those sweet nothings for nothing's sake. Just one last time before I wake. Wow. Cal too. I have never known what you saw in that dreary darkness that never seems to want to go away but insists to stay a while longer, if only to appease those attic ghosts, frazzled and fatigued, your words, were they? What you saw in me was the ultimate normalcy, like a child playing with his wooden boats and trains. The compass needle stays steady. My life has never known such fluctuations, never known the helplessness you feel, the confusion you sometimes feel, the sometimes anxiousness, distinct and then indistinct, as in any unrecorded dream. Cal, I'll, I've never known a life that's not been steady, or the lack of poetry. I've never known any such psychosis. I'd much rather touch your hand over lunch, 
some such cafe in fog-bound Mayfair, London, and reminisce what's passed between us and what will also. We are creatures of our imaginations and of the marvelous, almost childlike, almost eternal. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. This next poem actually takes place in this neighborhood before it was transformed. It's called Heart Crane, circa the late 20s. Mm -hmm. And in it, there are two little explanations that we're gonna make here. Uh, the word cabinet uh, is translated into English, means water closet. And um, the word, um, the word, What is the word? <laughs> <laughs> I'll find it in a second. I, I, I lost what the word was, and that isn't that funny. Um, yeah. Sleepers. If you're an aficionado of railroads, the yeah. word sleepers is actually yeah. the ties that keep the rails in place. Yeah. Yeah, that's all right. My sphincter will give way eventually. My intestines ready to explode. Any public cabinet will do a bar or two still open late, way late. The Bengay scent re-evaporates, spreading like havoc to the nose. Strident walks down Myrtle with an upward glance, those sleepers overhead, those hypnotic shadows where they flow <laughs> along the gutters leaching mold and breeding dust. My nameless crushes rapidly embraced by adjectives of lust and wanton lonesomeness. The Myrtle Brooklyn L transversing nowhere fast or the ghost of one. Where am I going? You gently ask. Is it the first or last of fragmented poetries or meanderings the barren streets? The dampness hits the nose, I pray the drizzle. There are no snowy, wintry scenes. <clears throat> actually, not the Valerie poem, but the, these poems I've been reading in this one are very recent, actually. Like this, this is about maybe, I don't know, 10 days ago. It has a kind of circuitous meaning to why I wrote this poem, which I won't get into because it could be a little boring. But in any case, this is a poem called Gil Orlovitz, Poet. How many opening lines have I attempted and discarded, and still I haven't been brought closer to you, to your personality, to the way you looked, kind of disheveled, crushed, crusty at the edges, maybe in need of a haircut even, is the way I remotely remember you, though my memory is mostly faulty, pretty much so. The why and wherefore of our one and only encounter, I want to say, circa 61 or 62 at most. Not the apres of spring or early fall, apres ski of this or that. Your name immersed in every magazine I turned to. Had you one of your own, I can't recall. Did you live on the Upper West Side for long, or is that also a mistaken memory? Why those gray and gloomy skies I associate with you? Why those elusive heavens when stepping out from the D train stop at West Forth to catch up with you? Why am I in such a rush to know more? And then your presence or your presences stopped suddenly. Everything about what I didn't even know about you shrunk from those early clues. This plunge into late 19th century Malame style obscurité and you were heard from no more. It was as if you turned into this poet Modi without a trace or a history, without a footnote even, as the traffic snarls its way past all those crenellated lamp posts, those ghostly dins and twilights. Joanne Kiger, no dates. 
Everyone is trying to do right by you, but you keep resisting, but you've left no clues to your existence. A few faded photographs, undated, one or two sketches to a life trailing off because you might have been distracted by a sudden slant of sunlight out your window by a sudden rainbow never wished for. Was it Kyoto? Was it the high Sierra still frozen in, even though it's spring with little dandelions here and there? The whole clump of years gone gray with spite, the life you never had, replaced by one much grander, imagined if only briefly. The girl in you is what I'm left with, what I remember, yet tough as nails when you want to be. I caught the drift, we never got that far. That one visit to New York remains a blank, a mystery, chain smoking your way through life like there was no tomorrow, like there was no forgetting and remembering. She died this year. Jean Stein. Yes, Jean, every person is speaking to you with their passionate words, with their dreams and their dreamings, their unspoken anxieties, their photographic memories becoming yours as well, right down to the dressmaker's creation, the intricate and difficult stitching, as in Edie's case, her black leotards, her anxious anorexia, a life of quiet desperation the parties of so many faces in those dark corners, those warren of rooms, those intimacies gently blossoming, bloom through the years, through the decades even, the pen that moves across the page and having writ, Dear Jean, can you hear me now in those lighthearted exchanges, those unfettered shadows, in the many anecdotes I've yet to divulge, the stories that matter as stories, what's revealed and concealed, what is so true? <laughs> is a in this poem there's a uh, a Yiddish word, a couple of Yiddish words, but I can't remember what they mean now. <laughs> I should have brought my dictionary with me, my Yiddish dictionary. <laughs> anyway, this is a poem to uh, Harry Roskolenko a poet from 1907 to 1980. He, he lived the last years of his life in West Beth. And uh, he, 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 gone down, he went down in history infamously, but not, but not wanted for having written a negative review of Frank O'Hara's first book of poetry in Poetry Magazine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he was, he was published a great deal in his lifetime, and he wrote a beautiful memoir about living, growing up on the Lower East Side. Harry Ruskalenko. 1907-1980. I'm past your birthday now, the year of your birth, but not by much, but not by the eye of a needle, past those wishes of ascending words, those fire escapes gone sleeping, those soundings in the alleys, those dirty dishes, those dark darknesses at noon, those days dawning, those streetcars clanging, those yawning trucks backing into curbs. Not by much, I want to say. Not the eye of the needle threading through, not by the memory of much, those nights up alone in the kitchen, the light fading, fading, Fundewelt, your dad and mine, like so many men sewing, with one with the one stroke too, the arm lifting, the quietude of snow sewing. Mm. I've written a number of, I'm only going to read one tonight, but I've written a number of poems for my cats. And this is one of them. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is Zazie, named after Zazie in the, in the Metro, by uh, Rima Kwanoa, oh, I think it is. Yeah. And um, anyway, she was a, a, an alley cat where I lived in Williamsburg, and she's with me now in Hudson. Zazie. In real life, I never get to hug you. You wouldn't let me. You put up such a fright when I hold you tight as if to harm you would come to you, as if great harm would come to you. <laughs> Not so, Zazie. How could I reassure you? 
So much affection do I pour on you with words, with sentences, with spurts of poetry to honor you, bow to your regal brightness, your blessed coat, your tortoise shell and white badge of the breed, which is you, Zazi. My drama queen, I wanna say, smart and skittish from the start when still a youngster, fending for yourself in that backyard, brambled as I watched. But that was Williamsburg, never envisioning we'd have this life together as you pass your first decade, not your last. Whatever life brings in each morning when you wake alert, whatever you and I remember. It's an interesting poet, fam fam favorite poet of mine who I don't think has ever had a, a translation of his work, a full-length book of his work in English. But in the 19th century, he did have a book, of, but the translations were not very good. And someone made a photocopy of the book out of uh, the Bops Library, had a copy of the book, obviously. Alphonse de Lamartine returns to the family house after more than two centuries, decades. Gone are the sounds of the passing landows, the barn cats, the cypress ali gently swaying at noon. The open French windows, the gossamer branches, the sky never more blue. So too the dog days when even the faintest of flickers, the fillies making their way to the barn as twilight descended, those clear and mild evenings, the drawing room filled with the chatter of friends, the quick bedtime embrace, the kiss on the forehead, a field of tall grass caught by a breeze in seclusion, those nights alone in the kitchen, those long ago rides into autumn. <laughs> Gabriel D'Annunzio. <coughs> D'Annunzio was famous for being D'Annunzio. He was once described by the mayor of Pescara as the author with the blue eyes and no means. <laughs> As a kid, he spent long hours by his window, lost in reverie. He was terrified of empty houses and soft summer breezes. When he stood with his head bent low, it was said an escapade was forgotten. Yet he always found time to walk and talk to his dogs nearing twilight, nibbling his hand, turning in a fandango of love and leaping. <laughs> Renee Gresham, widow of William Lindsay Gresham, 1909-1962. Perhaps it was just another break in some years back, or well, the charm that suddenly seduces out of nowhere long rehearsed till you realize too late that half your living life went walking straightway out the door into the noonday glare of some Sunday godforsaken place somewhere down in central Florida, the so-called widow state you thought was safe, which at the time still remained obscure, so obscure in fact, it was almost dark when you awoke and so unlike yourself as in a manic haze, rifling through those drawers for letters, tchotchkes, so much else. So you'd suddenly been had. There are times when the human frailties let down their guard. There is a ring of fire, Dante so numbered named for those who prey upon the old. The kids all grown up and living somewhere else. And you're left alone stumbling down the hall. It could have been a friendly call at first, a friendly knock a slight accent adding to the charm, a friend of a friend of a so-called friend, no time to trace. That noonday glare of sunlight as a halo for that added touch. Have you forgotten anything? Stefan Zweig, 
1881-1942. Stephens Weig, come back, come back. Do not be afraid. Do not look the other way, but on all sides. Come take the road with me into those dark woods where eerie sounds of nature coalesce where fledglings kiss you on the head and talk to you. Come fly with me. Come be my friend in those darkest hours, in those darkest woods where even dreams are not permitted, but they move in nonetheless because their darkest hours share with yours and mine to light the light where our angels lead us on with whisperings and they move on. Stefan, it's safe now. Come hold my hand. We circle home. The light is in the window. The dance is picking up. The dance is done. Can't you feel it now? Can't you? Can't you? Alphonse and Yolanda de Paula, no dates. How does one mourn the past with no clues given, or scattered fragments of photograph or two, autumn's last leaves turning of a now non-existence with no years left? Were Al and Yolanda here now, what would they tell me about me? That I had a winsome smile? that I was inquisitive, a chatterbox that charmed them to no end. There are no recorded times, no, re no strolls, no window shopping along the Fordham Road as it winds its hilly way to Webster Ave. Festooned with Strauss neons, the trolley clanging ghosts, cobblestones fitting in just so, now buried under so much tarmac trauma. The traffic snarled and clogged, the iron wrought lampposts torn down, shorn from their moldy roots. Storefronts so familiar you'd never think, where had they gone, the endless ghosts? Only snapshots yield to a conduit of time. My hair, once blonde, is now brown, a lighter brown, but that's no longer true. It's been over 60 some odd years, and yet, and yet some truths remain stubbornly true, and yet they go unquestioned as with Al, Yolanda, my upstairs neighbors, my upstairs world. How would they appear to be? What would they say to me if I were listening? They seemed to be true blue as they were soulmates to the very end. Where did they go? Where are they resting now beneath all that dross? Why don't I know? Heavenbound. I've been assigned the afterlife, so I go out looking for it, all bundled up. It's winter, not a sign of snow around. It's amazing I've gotten this far, finding myself a desolate stretch of highway somewhere in the Bronx, somewhere near the sound, choked with weeds and debris, the wind whistling with patches of God's light shining down. A little girl stops me singing, la, 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 la. Are you okay, mister? Oh, yes, I am. As I turn the corner, end of God. Thank you. Willard Moss, who was my mentor, was the moderator of that reading. Yeah. And uh, O'Hara read first. He opened up the reading. Yeah. And uh, he was yeah. only supposed to read for... I want to say, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. Yeah. And he went on for about uh, almost 40, 45 minutes. Pretty bold. Yeah. So uh, when Lowell yeah. began his reading, he prefaced it very modestly. Yeah. And I reminded him of this many years later. And he says, oh, you remember that? And he was only, and Lowell said at the reading, he said, and now I'm going to read a few poems of my own. Yeah. 
And, right. and, and that right. was it. And he, he read yeah. for about 15 right. minutes, and that was oh. it, you see. So, yeah. but, but the key, the operative word here was a few poems of my own. Of my own, yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. yeah. What, what do you see about the relationship of the visual work to your poetry? Find them paralleling each other? Well, I or? write, it's very, you know, what, it's a good question. I. I find myself uh, many a time, I don't know if it appeared that much in the poems tonight, but no. I find myself many a time writing about photography in my poetry, or some element of photography in my poetry. It's very easy to write about, about bringing photography into the poem as mm -hmm. a subject matter. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to try and capture that essence when you're taking a picture oh. in the reverse, you see. Right, right. It could be very corny. You'd end up with a you know a Hallmark Hall of Fame yeah, reading card yeah, photograph. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so you got to watch out about that. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so it's a, it's an interesting dynamic, which I think it only works. It's a one way street on that issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. You said some of these poems were very recent. Yes. When did you write your Jean Stein poem? Uh, <laughs> I wrote it uh, the day after I found out she passed away. Is that true of what uh, I wanted to say? Uh, never mind. Okay. It was another post-mortem poem. You're also um, a big audiophile, but you haven't really, I, I don't think I've read much about your passion for music. Your poetry. Uh, well, I, have, I do have, I didn't read any poems here tonight, but I do have poems. I, I've written a poem for I like to call him Dr. Howard Hansen. <laughs> uh, Howard Hansen, who was the director of the Rochester School of Music, uh, whose great piece of music is the Second Symphony. Uh, I have written poems for uh, Charles Ives on a number of occasions. Uh, so it, 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 the, the comp composers are very inspiring, you know. And I do listen to a lot of classical music, so it's, in that case, it's. A, it's something that seeps into your system when you're thinking or meditating about mm -hmm. even to attempt to write a poem. Also, well, when you're writing about the people or poets? No, I, I can't hard to compare the two. I mean, I, I probably written, I've written more poems about poets than I have to composers. But... Yes? What's your process? Are you pen and paper or are you computer? Uh, yeah, I do have a process, actually. <laughs> I, I like to, I, I, I start out with, well actually, to, to be really honest with you, I start out with the New York Times in the morning. And I use that as my first draft on, if I find a page that is sort of blank, like not too many words in the ads or something like that, so at least I can read my handwriting. You know? uh, so that would be the first draft. Mm -hmm. uh, then the second draft, but then sometimes if I don't work on the New York Times, I like to work on legal size yellow pads. And then from there, I will start working on the typewriter. And I own, I own a half a dozen typewriters. So I th go through a process of going through the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth draft. I'll type it up over and over to, to get it to where I'm really, and then when I'm really satisfied with it, I'll commit it to the computer for a file. Now, the, the irony, the funny thing about that is that once I've committed it to the computer, all of a sudden, I'll see something that I wanted to change that I wouldn't have noticed on the typewriter, mm -hmm. but I would notice on the printout mm -hmm. of the file, the computer file. So now I got to do a, a new kind of draft, which is I write on the bottom, newly revised on the printout, <laughs> draft number one, draft number two. It doesn't go past two drafts, I'm sure, but that's the process actually. Yeah. You ever knew what Jack Kerouac did? The what? You ever knew what Jack Kerouac did? What did he do? <laughs> oh, no, but uh, I did have the experience of actually being the first photographer to photograph the role. Oh. Yeah. He was in a filing cabinet at uh, Sterling Lord, who was an agent of, of Kerouac's, and Allen Ginsberg had commissioned me or arranged for me to photograph the role. I know nothing about it. And so I had to be very special about this. How am I going to photograph this object? Mm -hmm. So I actually created a light, not a light box, but a box that I had then draped with black velvet because I didn't want any backgrounds to interfere. And I, I took, I had access to the roll, I handled it personally. I put it in the box and then I photographed it on a tripod 
down onto the onto the roll. I just rolled it out, just maybe one one the size of one page, because mm -hmm. uh, it was very fragile. And then I put it back and put it in the filing cabinet. <laughs> yes. Um, so ironically, I only got like the three, the last three uh, poems. Uh -huh. right? That's so okay. I apologize for that. That's I really okay. Enjoyed them. Thank you. Um, but uh, strange question, I guess. Uh, do you ever find yourself in conflict between like your piece and the audience? What I mean is like, say a piece that you really, really love and you read it, but you don't really get a lot of love from the audience, or a piece that you no, really never I, liked I and never, the audience seems to love it? It never dawns on me, it never comes into my psyche. It's just something that you know doesn't happen or whatever. Yes? Oh, oh I'm, I'm sorry, I thought you were. <laughs> Uh, I, I think if you are, I mean, we all have a different Gerard, it almost seems. With, with the, I think of you as a great erotic writer, but I don't mean romantic love necessarily, mm -hmm. or a poet of real heroes. Do you, do you see yourself um, in a tradition like that? I don't know if I would use the word eros, but I would use the word love, actually. I, you know, I have to have a love for my subject. Yeah, or. I don't tell myself that, but I, when I start, when I get into the process where the poem is developing, uh, somehow the element of love comes into it. It's a very nurturing process, and it, it stays with me through, I want to say, the first few drafts of the poem. How about the, uh, the Joanne Cogger poem? Yeah. Was that when Joanne was alive? No, I wrote that poem after she after? died. Uh, what happened yeah, was <laughs> this year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what, well, the, the 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 poem is really about the lack of information. I got a call from the uh, New York Times, yeah, and they wanted. They said we can't we can't get any information about her at all. Mm -hmm. it, it was like I, they just didn't know where to go. Okay, so finally I said, well, you should call up Gary Snyder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was her first yeah. husband, right? mm -hmm. and yeah. her last yeah. actually. Although well, no, that's not sure. She was married three times. But that was her first husband. So finally that was settled. But I, all of a sudden I found myself brought into this dynamic of dealing with her life in terms of trying to help the obit writers. Yeah. So that's why the poem says, Joanne Kiger, no dates, because there were no dates that they could work from at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. And then, then I found, because I wasn't planning on writing a poem to Joanne Kiger, but all of a sudden I found myself drawn into this as if it was a, it was yeah. if a it was like a gravitational pull or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that's how that poem came about. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Figures. Sure, you've been a professional poet for longer than most people. Do you feel you're the same poet you were when you were 21 on Staten Island? Do you, looking back at those old poems, do you think, yes, that's, that's the same poet I am today? Oh, not at all. <laughs> 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 I don't know how to explain that, but it's, it's like, you know, you've come so far in your life and it doesn't, it doesn't even have to be poetry, it could be any number of things. And you're not, you're not the same person you were, you just developed in one way or another. Mm -hmm. right? All right, I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.